Just before we get started, I will say that this video is brought to you by Beard Blaze. Some of you may have heard this before, but I've got another channel called Business Blaze, and that actually led to the development of this very product, Beard Blaze. Basically, long story short, a fan of that channel wrote to me after I made a comment about every YouTuber having a beauty range, and he was like, Simon, don't make a beauty range, make a line of fabulous beard products, because You've got a fantastic beard. I might have said that last bit myself. But this is what we came up with. It is a range of beard oils. Will, the guy, the fan, he sent me a bunch of oils and I tried them out. And we basically came up with a bunch of different options that we both really like. And so far, everyone else seems to like so far. You can get them at beardblaze.com. Also, what we did is I'd used a lot of beard oils before. They sort of just keep your beard like super nice. And uh, especially as it gets bit a bit bigger, it like uh, just kind of brings in those stray hairs. Like, like, sort of like a moisturizer but for hair. It's fantastic stuff. And we also made it, I'd used them before. They'd always come in little tiny bottles. I made it in a big bottle and for a reasonable price. Beardblaze.com to get your hands on some of that. Mostly useful if you've got a beard. And uh, let's get into the video, shall we? Though they often get passed over, for more accessible and well-known attractions, natural and man-made subterranean structures are often more interesting and mysterious than their above-ground counterparts. Whether created by paranoid governments intent on surviving a nuclear holocaust, or by floods, meteorites, or eons of underground erosion, caves, craters, bunkers, and lairs are just downright fascinating. They're found all over the world, but in this video, we're just going to focus on the ones in America. So let's jump in. Located amidst southeast West Virginia's scenic Allegheny Mountains, the Greenbrier is a sprawling luxury resort that for much of the Cold War doubled as a potential last-minute nuclear retreat for Washington's political elite. Most of the original buildings were built more than a century ago by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, but though the railroad itself is among the most opulent and exclusive in the region, it hid a big secret that went undetected for decades, which was quite something considering that the bunker took years to build by hundreds of workers and required thousands of tons of concrete and steel, all of which was delivered by truck. Spread over more than 100,000 square feet, that's 9,300 square meters, and buried 720 feet, that's 219 meters underground, the bunker under the green briar is about the size of two American football fields stacked on top of one another. Design began in the 1950s, and construction got underway in the early 1960s, but contrary to popular belief, the underground shelter wasn't designed to withstand a direct hit from an ICBM. However, at least theoretically, it could have weathered a blast as close as 15 miles away, after which it would have been able to keep the politicians ensconced inside relatively safe and healthy for years afterward. Codenamed Project Greek Islands, the bunker was large enough to hold more than a thousand senators and congressmen, as well as their staffs and families, because who better to lead the nation through post-apocalypse rebuilding than those who failed to stop it in the first place. The two-story structure featured both private and communal areas and was decked out with state-of-the-art communications, air and water purification systems, as well as generators, decontamination facilities, and enough non-perishable food to last until the proverbial smoke cleared be a lot of smoke. It's not clear whether the Soviets even knew of the bunker's existence, but since it was nearly 250 miles away from Washington, D.C., which would have been ground zero in a thermonuclear attack, its 20-ton blast-proof doors were more than adequate. Thankfully, the bunker never had to fulfill the role for which it was built, but during the Second World War, it served as an internment center for high-ranking German and Japanese diplomats and captured military brass. It briefly opened during the 1942 season, but was bought, some say, against the owner's will by the U.S. Army for the paltry sum of $3.3 million, about $50 million today, which was well below its market value, after which much of it was converted into a 2,000-bed hospital that opened in late 1943. After the war, the hospital was closed after having housed nearly 25,000 patients and was resold back to the railroad for the original purchase price. Then, after a multi-year redecoration and modernization project, it reopened in 1948 and since then has hosted more than 25 presidents and vice presidents, as well as countless foreign dignitaries and heads of state, including the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson, Princess Grace of Monaco and Indira Gandhi. Though now the bunker is little more than an interesting historic curiosity, the resort, which has more than 700 rooms and dozens of bars, restaurants, and shops spread over more than 11,000 acres, still attracts well-heeled visitors from all over the world.
From December 1861 to January the following year, the central California coast experienced a truly epic Pacific storm, and the state capital of Sacramento bore the brunt of the destruction. Hammered by more than 40 days of incessant fury, the region was inundated with nearly four times its annual average rainfall, and the effects were felt as far away as the Midwest and even the Gulf Coast states, both of which were embroiled in the American Civil War. The city and the surrounding areas were deluged with hundreds of millions of cubic yards of water that washed thousands to their death and turned the Sacramento Valley into a vast freshwater sea that stretched nearly 300 miles inland. In addition, nearly one million head of cattle were lost, or approximately a quarter of the state's entire population, most of which belonged to small ranches. But though the worst was yet to come, local newspapers declared that Christmas had officially been cancelled and that in all likelihood the city would never recover. Less than a month later, paddle and steamboats sailed through all parts of the city, rescuing survivors from flooded streets that had once carried automobile and pedestrian traffic, and the state's newly elected governor had to travel via boat to the Capitol building for inauguration, after which the legislature was moved to nearby San Francisco. When the water finally receded, the corpses were collected and the damage was assessed. Many residents and officials called for the city to be abandoned permanently, lest the tragedy repeat itself. However, pro-rebuilding voices won the day and a massive reconstruction project began that would ultimately take nearly two decades and result in the city being raised between 9 and 14 feet. Other cities up and down the west coast had experienced similar storms and floods in the past, though none as large as the one that thrashed Sacramento, and it was the first municipality to attempt the mammoth undertaking of raising its street level, though Seattle to the north would do the same nearly three decades later. All told, thousands of homes and businesses were abandoned, and though many were still used as residences and storage areas in the following years, others were sealed off permanently, turning them into time capsules that wouldn't be rediscovered until decades later. The plan to rebuild the city had three central elements. The area's rivers would have to be permanently rerouted, levees and dikes would have to be upgraded and reinforced, and nearly all of the downtown area would have to be raised up. Despite abundant naysayers and a total cost that far exceeded a billion dollars in today's money, much of the actual work was carried out by private home and business owners and hordes of volunteers determined to return the city to its former glory at any cost. Though it's not clear just how big the Sacramento Underground is and how much of it has been rediscovered, it's likely that in the following decades as the city continues to expand that even more will be unearthed. Consisting of more than 400 miles of mapped passageways, Kentucky's Mammoth Flint Ridge Cave System is the largest known subterranean labyrinth in the world, nearly twice as long as the second longest Mexico's Sac Acton Underwater Cave. New discoveries and previously undetected connections add miles to this figure every year, hence its name, which has nothing to do with woolly mammoths, as is commonly thought. Anthropologists and archaeologists have found evidence that Native Americans explored the caves as much as 4,000 years ago, but it was probably only officially discovered in the late 18th century by local trappers and woodsmen. Located in west-central Kentucky, the park in which the cave system resides was established to protect the site in July of 1941 and now spreads over more than 52,000 acres across three counties. The temperature inside Mammoth Cave remains a relatively constant 55 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 12.7 degrees Celsius throughout the year, and the inside features waterfalls, otherworldly geological formations, flowing rivers, and an abundance of animals like blindfish and salad salamanders, albino shrimp, and endangered species of bats that have adapted to the nearly lightless conditions. The complex network of caves and passageways developed over millions of years as the underlying limestone strata and the sandstone above it were fractured, flooded, and eroded repeatedly, a process that is still happening today and making the caves even larger. Though most of the uppermost cap rock is too hard and dense for water to penetrate, exceptions occur in areas where vertical cracks are formed, hence, unlike other caves that are perpetually wet, much of the Mammoth Cave is dry and therefore has few stalactites and stalagmites which only form in the presence of dripping water. Much of the water that does find its way into the caves is from natural springs, but more comes from rain runoff at higher elevations, which make for dramatic scenes in some areas, like at the frozen Niagara Room, where a waterfall flows for much of the year. Despite its porous nature and multiple layers, Mammoth Cave is particularly stable, which makes it safe for visitors and guided tours, as well as scientists and spelunkers, the latter of which often resort to clandestine explorations in precarious areas that are technically off-limits. 
Each of the sedimentary rock layers above the caves are divided into multiple formations and further subunits, but though one particularly dark portion of the cave is commonly referred to as the bottomless pit, it's been found to only be slightly more than 100 feet deep. Mapping has been done by multiple methods, including physical exploration, as well as using ground-penetrating radar and sound waves to reveal both solid and open areas, all of which together have provided an accurate representation of even areas that people have never actually visited. The cave was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1981 and an international biosphere reserve in 1990. Located 40 miles west of Flagstaff, Arizona, the absolutely named Meteor Crater is a massive depression caused by a meteorite slamming into the site approximately 50,000 years ago. You probably guessed that. However, up until the 19th century, it was assumed that it had been caused by a volcanic steam explosion emanating from the San Francisco Mountains, Arizona, not California, just 40 miles west. At an elevation of more than a mile above sea level, the huge bowl measures nearly 4,000 feet across. It's more than 550 feet deep and is surrounded by a rim that protrudes nearly 150 feet above the adjacent desert. Over the years, the crater has had various names, most of which were derived from the last names of the men who discovered, studied, and owned it, but also due to nearby towns like Meteor, Arizona, and other natural landmarks in the vicinity like Diablo Canyon. These days, Meteor Crater is most commonly referred to as Barringer Crater after geologist Daniel M. Barringer, who proposed and later proved that it had been created by an impacting meteorite and not a volcanic explosion nearby. Shortly thereafter, Barringer filed a mining claim for the land around the crater, and his family still owns it to this very day. It's thought that the offending meteorite was composed primarily of nickel and iron, that it was ovular and approximately 160 feet across, and that it weighed a staggering 100 million tons, and that when it plowed into the earth, it was traveling between 29,000 and 45,000 miles per hour, though as much as half of its total mass may have burned off in the atmosphere. Even so, the resulting energy at impact was calculated to be the equivalent explosion of a nuclear device with a 10 megaton yield, or more than a thousand times more powerful than the ones dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. Other much older meteor craters in various parts of the world are much less preserved due to age and wind and water erosion. The relatively young age of meteor crater paired with the dry Arizona climate have allowed it to remain in nearly pristine condition, but despite attempts to make the crater a public landmark, it has always remained on private land, and as such, it's not protected as a national monument, which would require federal ownership. However, it was designated a national natural landmark more than five decades ago, and during the 60s and 70s was training for the Apollo moon mission. It has also had its share of mysterious incidents, like the one in 1960s when two commercial pilots attempted to fly over the crater in a tiny Cessna. However, as they approached the opposite rim, the plane stalled, crashed, and caught fire. Though badly injured, both pilots survived. It was later reported that the plane ran out of fuel, which actually wasn't the case. In fact, the pilots claimed that the stall was not caused by a loss of engine power, but by a lack of sufficient lift under the wings, which was unlike anything they'd ever experienced. A small portion of the wreckage is still visible from the crater's rim. So, I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.